Hello, hello. Thank you. Hello. Right. hello. How hello. is it going? Welcome to our May virtual tasting. We are Thank super. You. Yeah, we're super excited. And this is the first time we've done it on a Friday, which I have to say, at least for me, this is a great way to end my week, round it out. And it's uh, a great way to start my, my weekend. Yeah, exactly. It's um, really, really fun. I'm super stoked that we're doing this on Friday. Plus, we have a great lineup of wines that we're going to try today. Um, we are we called this tasting our Piedmont de Puglia tasting. So we are going to start in Piedmont and then make our way down to Puglia and then actually zoom back up to Sardinia and talk a little bit about the different varieties that we got for you. Um, but before we jump into the fun part, which is the drinking of the wine, um, we are just going to introduce ourselves really quickly. I see some familiar faces. I know you guys have, some people have joined multiple times. So you may have heard our little spiel before, uh, but for those of you who haven't, I am Megan Klein. I'm part of the second generation at Jacuzzi Family Vineyards and at Klein Family Cellars as well. And I have been working with my family for the past six years, doing a little bit of everything from the winemaking side of things to hospitality to you name it, uh, as you do in a family business. Uh, but I have to say, working at Jacuzzi and working with these varieties has been super interesting, super rewarding. And not only that, uh, learning a little bit more about the history behind Jacuzzi and my uh, family heritage has been really, really amazing. Um, so yeah, you know, I before I came back to work with my family, I was a sommelier and when you're studying for your psalm test you learn about all the basic varieties right the cabernet the sauvignon blanc the chardonnay and pinot noir but you never really learn about Geraldigo. so it's been <laughs> fun um <laughs> really diving into that and uh yeah exploring the world of italian wines i don't think i'll ever be able to talk about all of them. I think there's over 5,000, but we're gonna get into some fun ones today. So that's a little bit about me. We have with us our winemaker at Jacuzzi, Tom Gendel. Uh, he's been the winemaker here for the past two, three years now. 2018, yeah, since 2019. Yeah, yeah so um, Tom, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your background. Yeah, so my name is Tom Gendel. Um, I'm from New Zealand. I uh, got I went straight from high school to university and got a winemaking degree. Um, yeah, and then from there did harvest in New Zealand and also in Germany. And then I was part of a vineyard management team for a couple of years before I moved over to California in 2011 and uh, worked in both Napa and Sonoma County, working with you know Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot, Chardonnay, and things like that. Um, getting a bit more knowledge about some other varieties. Too. Um, and then I started with Klein and Jacuzzi in 2016. Um, yeah, and I can definitely attest, uh, even with a degree, I walked into Jacuzzi and was like, I've never heard of these varieties. And um, the ones we're tasting today I'd heard of, obviously, but uh, some of the other more interesting ones, I was like, wow, it's so cool to learn about this. And um, it has been a fun journey the last five years, learning about them, trying new wine making techniques and just having a lot of fun making these wines and really proud to show them to you guys and share them and um, really enjoy drinking them. Um, yeah, so that's a, I think that covers it. Yeah, <laughs> good, good work, Tom. Um, and then we are also with someone that a lot of you may recognize, Mr. Jesse McGrew. He is our wine club manager at Jacuzzi. So Jesse, you want to say hello? Yeah, hi guys. Um, my name is Jesse. Um, I'm the wine club manager at Jacuzzi. I've been in the wine industry for the past 15 years almost now. Um, mostly always doing wine club related um, stuff. I just, um, you know, I really love it. The, these virtual tastings are fairly new. We just started them last year. I really love them because um, some of you, I, you know, I've talked to over the phone several times, but to actually get a, to put a face with the name is um, really great. Um, I see that like Patricia Goldsmith's on here. Um, really <laughs> nice to meet you. I've, I've talked with you over the last couple of years. She has um, a son named Jesse as well. Um, and then another person, Emilio Torres, good to see you're on here. Um, but yeah, I just really, really 
get excited to um, put a face to the name and do these tastings. Yeah, awesome. Well, okay, so like I said, we have a great lineup of wines today going from Piedmont to Puglia, and we're gonna start um, in Piedmont. Uh, so yeah, today we're trying our, our nice, our Primitivo and our Giocondo Grenache. Um, you know, we talked about this a little bit, but we when, when Tom took over as winemaker, we really sat down and wanted to examine our Italian counterparts for all the varieties that we make. So we sat down, we got um, the Italian versions of these wines, tasted them next to ours and really studied the winemaking techniques and all of that. And that has really informed all of our wines at Jacuzzi since. And it's been great. We really are trying to emulate those styles and then bringing our own kind of California twist to these wines. And I think we've done such a great job. I'm, I'm really, really excited about the wines and specifically our 2020 Arnais, which is where we're gonna start. Uh, so if you have your bottle open, make sure to pour yourself a little glass and we are gonna dive right in. And this one is really fun. Uh, first of all, because Arnais in Italian means little rascal. Um, you guys may have heard that before and typically from all of our research that is because it's called that because it's historically been hard to grow in the vineyard and so you know Tom I'll ask you about this in a little bit and get your take on that and see if you find that to be true for the California version um, and yeah it's, it's a really really interesting variety this is found uh, in the Piedmont region and I'm gonna share my screen really quick so we can take a look at where that is. It's that northern piece right here. Um, and so I think typically when you think of the Piedmont re region, you think of Nebbiolo, think of Barolo and Barbarasco. I don't think a whole lot of people are talking about the white wines, although they should because it's really an interesting and really, really expressive variety. Um, I, you know, I put my nose in here and I get those white florals right away a lot of that minerality, a lot of uh, that citrus as well. It's just a really, really beautiful wine. And, you know, historically, this was also blended into the nebulas of this region to really soften out the tannin. So it, it also has a really great body. It does have this like really medium to, to bigger body. I think it, it really fills up your mouth. It's just a delicious, delicious wine. So uh, Tom, what do you thoughts about this being hard to a hard variety to work with in the vineyards um, and tell us a little bit about your winemaking process and your overall thoughts on the wine. Yeah um, no this is really really fun to make um, so it's grown we grow this in Pitaluma Gap and um, no it's, it's just we're, it's a grower um, Amanda Seha grows the great for us he is a third generation grower in Sonoma so fantastic growers um, fantastic farmers and make amazing grapes. Um, so it's basically right on the, you, you can see the map there, um, it's on the west, the eastern boundary of the Petaluma Gap, yeah, down there. So just on the hill, the hill over from uh, where the winery is. And uh, this is one of our last picks. We picked this very, very late. It's thin skinned, that's why it's called the Little Rascal. Um, so it's very, very prone to disease. Um, we've got great girls out there who keep the canopy nice and open. Um, not too many clusters of crowding or anything like that. It throws a pretty light crop as well. So, um, but still really, really late ripening. Um, we pick it at like 22, 23 bricks. That's why it's got that nice 13% alcohol to it. Mm -hmm. um, and got all those wonderful citrus characteristics. Being the cool climate that the Pilama Gap is, um, you get that full development of flavor. Those wonderful lemon curd characteristics, the white flowers, like Megan was saying. I get a little kind of spice, like almost unnameable spice. I gave it the name cardamom for bit, like a better word. And it's got that nice cookiness as well. It's just got this wonderful depth of detail. Um, and hanging it out there for a long time is kind of one of the advantages. Um, yeah, wonderfully farmed vineyard. These guys have been doing it for three generations, like I said. So we do have that luxury of kind of getting that full flavor development. Um, in the winery, we keep it pretty simple. Um, we whole cluster press it and then we put it into tank for settling for two days um, and then just a really cold fermentation um, with basically a yeast strain designed to elevate the floral characteristics and to kind of keep preserve that fruit characteristic in there. Um, and then we put, turn around and bottle it pretty quickly, um, generally speaking. Um, yeah, it just stays in stainless and we just really kind of want to preserve the freshness 
the vibrancy, the acidity is perfect. It's almost got that creamy acidity, that minerality and that lemon curd mixed in with that nice creamy acidity. It's fantastic. And it's super um, thirst quenching and just really, really fun. I'm looking forward to drinking a lot of this over the summer. Yes, me too. I'm actually, I'm going on a walk after this and this is going to be my walk wine. <laughs> uh, but it, it's so good. And actually in my research, you know, when we've talked about our nays, uh, historically in Italy, it tends to actually, one of the reasons it's called Little Rascal is because it doesn't hold acidity very well. But I think that's why the Petaluma Gap is such a great place to grow this variety because it is that cooler growing region. It can make, it helps the grapes maintain that acidity. And I think really makes for this super complex, like wonderful white wine. Yeah, no, definitely. The, it's such a cool spot in um, the Petaluma Gap. We got all the wind and the fog, um, but you know, like it's all, to, uh, all, all basically protected because um, it's at the bottom of the hill, but just wonderful vineyards, um, the airflow through it. The guys manage the vineyards, uh, do a great job. They kind of um, do a little bit of leafing around the bunch zone and make sure none of the clusters are touching. It throws a pretty light crop and 2020 was an especially light crop. It was by hmm. far the earliest harvest we've had. Um, however, it, but also it was a really, really light crop. And so um, that just means you get a bit better concentration of flavor. Um, I think this one's shown super, super well. I'm looking yeah. forward to this. And with the acidity it's got, and that vibrancy, it's going to be fun to see it develop over five years as well. Yeah. Jesse, what do you think? And uh, well, what are a your... couple um, things, you know, because I always like to use um, the opportunity to learn um, and kind of dive deep, a little deeper and learn about these wines. And one of the um, kind of the cool things I learned about the Arnais was, was actually back um, in the 1900s, um, when they would actually grow this right next to the Nebbiolo grapes mm -hmm. in Italy, um, because they tended to, these, the Arnaise grapes tend to be a little bit more pungent. So it would attract the birds and the, and the bees and stuff um, and attract it away from the Nebbiolo grape because oh, the ne Nebbiolo grape was always the mo more sought after thing in, in that region. Um, so um, I found that pretty um, interesting. And then actually, by the early um, 1970s, um, we the there was only 8,000 um, acres of Arnais planted worldwide. So wow. it um, it really got close to going away for some time, and then um, then they started producing it again, and and it got popular, and people found um, how how awesome of a wine it could be, and um, it, you know, people that are into drinking like Pinot Grigios or something um, yeah. uh, kind of sought after this wine because it's it's similar to that, but with a little bit more funk and character. Yeah, uh, totally. I would say this is like a Pinot Grigio's uh, more complex older sister or brother. <laughs> yeah. it's, like, it's the contemplative one that's like writing poetry. Uh, that, <laughs> that's, that's fine. <laughs> Um, but actually, I, honestly, it's, it is crazy that there were only 8,000 acres of this left at one point. And I think just another testament to what we're trying to do at Jacuzzi is like, find out, find these varieties that are a little lesser known, um, and really develop them into our program. I mean, I think we've made our nays for quite a long time. Um, like maybe even since our inception, but, uh, it's a great yeah. wine and yeah, sorry, it's, go ahead. it's been one of our staples and Arnais is just synonymous with Italy as well. I would, I, I kind of think of it more as like a re, the Italian's version of reason with all that citrus yeah. blossom and the minerality and the floral notes. Um, just a delicious, awesome wine. It's um, yeah, it's great to be able to show today. I've already finished my glass. Oh, yeah. really <laughs> I, I know. I'm, I'm, this is the one I was sampling before uh, we jumped on. Um, okay. So let's talk about food pairing. What would you guys go straight to one? I think, okay. For me, um, going to goat cheese just because goat cheese has that nice acidity um, with this would be really really nice just to like match that brightness or you could go opposite I don't know um, that was just like straight where my mind went what about you guys I'd go for like a, a white chicken pasta um, just chicken yeah. and a white pasta sauce um, goes amazingly I think maybe a little bit I like the opposite so in in there. For, meats for this to like yeah, I think it's a complex enough wine to hold like a nice pasta sauce, like a white mm -hmm. pasta sauce, I think would be amazing with this. Uh, Carbonara might be a little heavy, 
but mm. yeah, the next step down from carbonara would be awesome i think yeah. i would go with like some fish and chips like i just want some fish um you know fried fish with some french fries so the greasiness yeah. with this i feel like the acidity would really cut the fat on that really yeah, well just any fried food yes that's actually mm. that's an awesome some mozzarella sticks throw those in there too oh yes <laughs> How about if, yeah, if anyone else has some like great pairing ideas or some good tasting notes, let us know. Um, we actually, we have this wine paired with a shrimp and couscous salad on our website, which I think would go really, really nicely. Anything that has that freshness too. I think this is a really versatile wine for food pairing because you can either match it with that same level of freshness and acidity, or you can match it with something that's a little bit fattier and this can cut through that. So, or you can drink it on its own, which I mean, the walk wine, you know, the, the poolside wine, that is definitely this. Um, oh, and here comes the dog. <laughs> um, yeah, if you guys have any questions about this wine, please let us know. You can you feel free to unmute yourself and we can chat or drop it in the, in the chat box. Um, and if there are no questions, we can move on to our Primitivo. Mm, so yeah, if you have your Primitivo open, go ahead and I'm not gonna dump that. I'm gonna just move on to my second class. Um, mm, all right. Yeah, so make sure you pour yourself a glass. And we are going to move on to our Primitivo. And so, you know, our tour of Italy is kind of going, we're kind of doing a little bit of a circle. We decided, you know, we wanted to go north to south and then go to the middle because, you know, <laughs> yeah. a little bit more that way. <laughs> um, and so now we are going to the south. We're going to Puglia. So the Piedmont's the northwest and this we're going to the southeast, not as far south as Sicily, of course, but um, this other kind of closer to the heel. Um, and this is really where Primitivo is most well known, where it's grown. Um, and, you know, I think at, this is also another really interesting variety. Um, of course, this is the Italian Zinfandel. And there has been a lot of research in, talking about how Primitivo and Zinfandel are the same and it's true they are the same grape they are different clones from my understanding these are different clones um and also from my understanding primitivo tends to ripen a bit earlier than zinfandel does so they're not considered interchangeable with um like we couldn't call our zinfandel primitivo and we can't call our primitivo zinfandel with our labeling laws so they are Oh, hey, Pax. <laughs> they are considered different. Um, and I really love this wine too. I mean, talk about something that really has that wonderful fruit, a lot of that fresh strawberry, um, and kind of balanced out with that spice, really wonderful mouthfeel. Just, I think like overall, a really classic, another staple of ours that we have made for a very, very long time. Mm. It's a delicious wine. Um, Tom, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on the difference between Primitivo and Zinfandel, if you have anything else to add to that, uh, but. Yes. Um, oh, so sorry, yeah, I wouldn't, um, we, we, obviously we make a lot of Zinfandel at Klein, but the Primitivo is special. Um, so we basically, Primitivo has got looser clusters and smaller berries. I wasn't listening, I was dealing with my two, my three-year-old. That's why I never <laughs> do the tastings inside because I have a three-year-old and it's very difficult <laughs> to do tastings inside when you have a three-year-old. So he's going to go outside and hang on that, hang out on the hammock while I chat with him. There we go. Uh, yep. But um, yeah, so smaller, cl uh, looser clusters, smaller berries, less mm -hmm. disease prone, which is fantastic, means you can hang it a little bit longer. But like Megan's saying, if you've got smaller berries and looser clusters, it's gonna ripen a little bit earlier. So we do get a little bit of ripening early. Um, we try to pick this kind of pinpoint balance um, at 25 bricks to get us to that 14 and a half, 15 percent alcohol. Um, we don't wanna manipulate it too much in the winery. I absolutely love the detail on this wine. It's good, gorgeous. Um, Contra Costa County, um, 20, 2018 was a quite a cool vintage, but in Contra Costa, that means it's perfect. Um, it means we got perfect ripening, good hang time, 
Um, I like the oak coming through on this as well. Some nice yeah. little chocolate notes coming through there too. And um, just a really, really fun wine. Very expressive. Lots of berry fruits coming out of there. Jumps out of the glass. This is showing really well. 2018, you know, it's funny. We, we're always, you know, bottling wines and in a rush and stuff. And it's nice to taste them. You know, this was bottled over a year ago. And I think it's really starting to show now. Um, it's got wonderful fruit. Um, really, really bright acidity as well, but really balanced with the alcohol and the sweetness in there. Uh, Primitivo has naturally got a, quite a sweet fruit profile as well. And I think you've got a nice balance there of all these things coming through. Um, the oaks adding in there as well, a little bit of spice too. And just, um, yeah, really stoked with this wine. Yeah. Uh, Jesse, what are your thoughts? Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to lie. When, when, we're, when I was working with Alex, our taste room manager, and coming up with these um, selections for the virtual tasting. Um, there was a couple that I definitely picked because I was like, I want to, I want to try this wine because it's been a while. And, um, you know, I haven't tried the Primitivo and, um, since the, the 18 since, um, it came out about a year ago. Um, so I was really looking forward to this wine. And like Tom said, it's just showing great right yeah. now. I'm, I mean, like, I'm like, wow, I could, I could definitely go buy a couple more of these bottles and have them at home um i i would definitely like be in the backyard with with my grill going and 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 drinking this wine for sure absolutely i mean i think that is a classic pairing for not only primitivo but zinfandel and you know i think with some of that red fruit too on here i would of course go pizza just because you have to go pizza with at least one of these wines because they're Italian. And I think this out of all three, this is a good pizza and or burger wine. Um, yeah, the, yeah, the juicy flavors and the bright acidity and the, like the sweet fruit coming through, it would go amazing with most grilled meats. Um, I could even yeah. do ribs for this, you know, pork ribs would go oh, fed, yeah. with that fettiness, mm -hmm. just kind of the, the sweetness of the barbecue sauce all coming in together there. Um, yeah, any grilled meats would be fantastic. Burgers, um, you know, chicken with a bit of spice as well, because this can also ha handle a bit of spice with the sweet fruit that's going in there. Yeah. Um, you don't have to worry about blowing the tannins out or anything like that. So the tannins are kind of actually pretty attractive on this. They're not too grippy or anything like that. They're starting to soften and sweeten and just really, really delicious and easy to drink. This is, um, you know, this is definitely very quaffable outside. I, I would, I'm really liking this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was so, putting together the slideshow and I and I and I was doing the cherries with the mushrooms, I was like, man, I haven't tried this in a year. I'm like, am I, are we sure? We have cherries and mushrooms, but I mean, it was definitely like that that cherry fruit and then the um, earthiness, kind of the, the mushroom earthiness on the finish. Yeah. So one of the differences is um, that we we put American oak on this. Um, American oak really kind of likes uh, Primitivo. Um, what you get out of American oak is you get more vanilla. So when you go to those toast levels, um, yeah, American oak is renowned for its vanilla-ness. And um, what you get with a higher toast, you get a little bit of coffee in there. So that vanilla coffee characteristics coming through really nicely um, that are really like yeah. it and adds to that sweet fruit character. Okay. So uh, we have a question about who is on the front label. So I, the, oh, oh, sorry, moving ahead. Um, these two wonderful people, that is my great grandfather, uh, Valeriano Jacuzzi and, um, oh God, uh, and, um, <laughs> this is so embarrassing. Uh, what, Julia? No, that's not, uh, anyway. Yes, Sabina. Just Thank you. Thank you. Just Pina. <laughs> That's my great grandmother. She would be very disappointed in me. Um, so yeah, these are really jacuzzi um, as a winery was, was started by my father to honor his grandfather, Valeriano, who was the person who taught him all about making wine. So my dad was one of nine children. He grew up in Los Angeles. He was the middle child. He was the troublemaker of the family. So when he was about uh, 14, 15, his parents were like, you're too much. You need to go learn hard work and go live with your grandparents uh, up in Northern California. So my great grandfather had a ranch in Contra Costa County, which is where these grapes come from, um, where he would 
he was growing grapes. He was also growing things like almonds and peaches. And um, that is where my dad learned all about growing grapes and making wine because uh, Valeriano would make the wine for the entire extended Italian family. He was one of 13 kids. Uh, so there was quite a few people to make wine for. And he taught, um, he taught my dad everything that he knows. So my dad really, he, he learned the value of hard work and he was like, I love this lifestyle and uh, ended up going to UC Davis, came back to Contra Costa County, started Klein Cellars in 1982. And as he was growing Klein, he really in the back of his mind always knew he wanted to pay homage to his grandfather. Uh, so in 2007, which was a hundred years after the Jacuzzi family came to America, they came in 1907, um, he opened Jacuzzi Family Vineyards and uh, was really, it was always dedicated to his grandfather and to the Italian heritage uh, that he, he learned and, and just the Italian lifestyle that he had growing up and staying up on the farm in Oakley, which was, you know, wine at lunch. He, he talked about having wine at lunch that was watered down with water. Um, and just, you know, it's, it's all about Italian hospitality. So uh, it's, it's been really amazing. And okay, uh, let's see what else we got in this Paul's family's from Puglia. That's great. Jusamina. And we are from the Veneto region. That is where my family is from. So more north. And um, actually the jacuzzi building, um, the jacuzzi tasting room is modeled after the family home. Uh, and it was really, if you, maybe next time we can pull up a picture of the old Italian family home. And it's really a layout of the same concept. So yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, and I did want to say before we move on to the Grenache, um, you know, before we all got on, we were talking about our favorite cuts of meat. And um, yes, we get to talk meat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it was just so funny when you guys were like, oh, this would go great with any sort of cut of meat. Um, so we want you all to think about what your favorite cut of meat is and what you would have with the primitivo. <laughs> So that, that was um that was an interesting story. I didn't I didn't know that your dad um was the middle child uh, of yeah. a bigger family. Uh, I mean I'm the middle of of uh, seven, and uh, yeah, I spent a lot of time yeah. with my grandpa when I was a kid. <laughs> I got sent to grandpa's farm as well. <laughs> yes. Oh my god, that's so funny. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, I'm also the middle child of seven, so middle yes. children unite. I love it. Yes. Um, great. Yeah, if you guys have any more questions about one, the history, or um, yeah, hopefully I can remember everyone's name next time. Um, but yeah, the history or the wine, if you guys have any questions about the Primitivo, just drop it in the chat or let us know. And while you think about that, and while you think about your favorite cut of meat, um, make sure to pour yourself a glass of our Gicondo Grenache. Here we are. This is our 2019. All right. So on our tour of Italy, we are going to the islands now. We are headed to Sardinia. So we started up north here, up north here, went here. Now, oh, I guess we're going more lateral um, over to Sardinia. So this island, this is where uh, Cannonau is grown. And that is the Italian name for Grenache. Uh, I love, love, love our new Grenache. This is our very first release of a Grenache at Jacuzzi. And to me, this just is the epitome of what Grenache should taste like. It has that really wonderful high tone red fruit. So that raspberry, that cherry, tons of cherry on here, just like really beautiful. And then I get some of that spice as well. And um, it's great, you know, in our research, we found 
some evidence that, and there's a, actually a big feud going on about where Grenache originated from. So Sardinia claims that Grenache Cannonau was first established or found originated from Sardinia. Um, Spain wasn't too happy about that. They think Grenache uh, <laughs> was originated from Spain. There is, you know, a big feud, but we like to think that it came from Sardinia. And that's really what we are emulating when we made this Grenache. And just like I said, such a beautiful wine. I love the tannin, I love the acidity. I think, um, yeah, Grenache tends to have a little bit of that higher acidity. And I think that makes this wine the perfect wine to lay down. The, like, I think this wine is going to age really, really nicely. Um, and it's a great wine to end on. It definitely has that bigger body, great tannin, just um, a wonderfully, wonderfully structured wine. And um, Tom, you know, this has grown on our Los Carneros um, J Puppy Vineyard, which is our state vineyard. And these are some fairly new vines that we have. So I would love to have you talk a little bit about the vineyard and the winemaking process for this first vintage of our Grenache. Yeah, no, this one's, this one we got excited about. We're really, really happy to bottle this first vintage and to share with you guys. I really, really love this wine. Um, this was kind of, you know, as far as winemaking and stuff like that, we really got to sink, got to sink our teeth into this, so to speak. So because we farm the fruit ourselves. Um, so this is literally at the winery. It's a stone throws from my office. Um, it was, it, this is young vine. So we're only just starting to see the potential of this stuff. Um, this is, you know, first, first time we really made a wine up out of it. It was planted in 2016. Um, we planted it to three different rootstocks. Um, we selected kind of the best portion of the block. And then we've got a great vineyard team. We sent them in. We got the crop just lying just perfectly. We went through and leaf plucked. We did everything by hand. And um, it really just shows through wonderfully. Um, you know, Grenache is such a cool, expressive variety. It's got like um, those high tone fruits that Megan was saying. It's got all this wonderful character as well. The spice is coming through. It's got a nice layer of oak in there. And um, so basically, yeah, we brought this into the winery. Um, we we actually closed top fermented this. Um, in future iterations, we're gonna do a mixture of closed top and open top fermentation, um, but it gave this nice dark brooding characteristic to the wine. It's got all this character, but not losing those high tone fruits as well. And uh, just gave us this really expressive wine. Um, it's been about two weeks on skins, pumped over regularly. Um, and then we put it down to an amazing array of French oak. Um, normally we kind of keep our oak programs pretty simple, but um, with kind of these, these reserve style wines, we're flourishing our arms a little bit and uh, pulling from a wide range of coopers to kind of really layer those spices in there and to give us a nice detailed wine out of it. And um, yeah, it's been 18 months in oak. Um, we then went through and basically chose the best barrels for the selection and uh, bottled that. And so we're super proud to show this to you guys for the first time. It's really, yeah. It's fun to make fun, really, really fun to make this kind of a wine and really kind of, yeah, just really kind of trounce your arm and have something fun. And I think the next few years, this is only going to get better as we get, as we hone the whole program in as well. And, um, you know, we've been making Primitivo and NS for a few years now, so we kind of know what we're doing with it, but uh, making a whole new variety and being really kind of given, um, really kind of get to make the whole thing from start to scratch each year, it should get um, noticeably better as well. So it's, it's a lot of fun and um, cool to share. Absolutely. And so, yeah, what are your thoughts on aging potential? Because like, to me, I think this is the perfect candidate for a oh, wine yeah. to lay down. Um, oh, somebody got seen a late cutting preview. Anyway, um, so this is, yeah, the acidity and the alcohol together. I mean, you've got, it's got that nice mouthwatering acidity, which is what we're going for. Um, we want it to be juicy. We want it to be lively and really, really vibrant in the mouth. So you get this wonderful mouthwatering acidity. Um, and then on top of that, you've got a good chunk of alcohol in there and, um, just that fruit concentration, you've got a really concentrated core of fruit. So I don't see that moving anywhere very quickly. I'm thinking 10, 15 years plus, if not 20, I think this is going to be a really, really cool stellar wine. And as far as Grenaches go, it'll be right up there with the best of them for ageability. Um, there's not, yeah, there's not many people who get to make this kind of Grenache. Um, we grow it ourselves farm it and we work it really hard in the winery and it's just kind of a really cool expression of, of Grenache and um actually we should do a blind tasting sometime and get some other wines yeah that'd, that'd be, be fun because I'm really really stoked on this one 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I am too. And, you know, I am actually really surprised also that it comes in at 15% because it is so nicely balanced. Like it is the perfect combination, I think, of alcohol, tannin, acidity, flavor. Like it is such a wonderful wine. I'm I'm so stoked on this as well. And really quickly, Jesse, before I get to your thoughts and your uh, take on everything, um, Joy had a question and the um, bottle shot that we showed up on the slide for the Primitivo said Lake County. And that was because one of our previous vintages was from Lake County, but the mm -hmm. one that everyone should have gotten should say Contra Costa County, we, we switched where we were getting our Primitivo. God, I don't, I can't remember when, Tom, but. It was either 17 or 16. So um, was it, it was either, yeah, it was around about 2017 or 2018 was the first vintage we moved to Contra Costa. Um, yeah. We just have these wonderful growers in Contra Costa that have these beautiful old Primitivo vineyards. And, yeah. um, you know, when we don't get to make a Primitivo from those grapes, they end up blowing into our Zinfandel blends over at Klein, which is just a shame because um, we've got beautiful yeah. wines out there. So it was kind of a fun change to be able to go and take these old vine Primitivo vineyards and actually make a Primitivo for them because that's what they want, you know? Yeah, and it what, was, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say the 17 was the first uh, vintage from Contra oh, Costa. Nice. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, one time I did a um, kind of a side-by-side -side tasting of the 16 and the 17 in the club member room. Um, and um, by far, everybody was picking the 17. Um, they, they definitely liked yes, the... Yes. Primitivo that. likes the warm climates. Um, mm -hmm. So the difference you're going to notice there, when you're growing Primitivo up in Contra Costa, it's a very cold climate. You're ripening it much, much later. So what you'll get is you'll get, you'll get a bigger wine, but much more aggressive. Contra Costa, you'll get these wonderful ripe fruit flavors and these smooth, rich, rounded tannins. So it's much more enjoyable to drink. Um, unfortunately, probably you won't get the ageability out of Contra Costa, but you'll get much more enjoyment out of the wine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. Okay, so uh, Grenache, guys, or the Giocondo. Oh, Jesse, let's hear. I want to hear your. Yeah, I mean, I really love this wine. I love the fruit, um, you know, the bright fruit, the acidity, um, the tannins that you get. Um, I, I always love a, a wine that has a little bit of some grippy tannins on the finish. Um, oh, wow. I would definitely probably throw some carne asada on the grill um, and have some carne asada with this. I know meats, it's all about meats today. Oh, um, meat. Or you could even do like chop up the carne asada and have some tacos. Um, I, I think like, um, I think like some um, uh, avocado guacamole would actually weirdly go well with this wine for some reason okay. is what I'm thinking. I don't know. I come up with some strange stuff. It's never, it's never the meta of what you would think you would want. <laughs> with I love it though. I, you know, I, I was saying I went through my psalm thing and they were so kind of strict about the food and wine pairings. And it was like, match this with this and this with this. And, you know, there were all these rules that you had to follow. But since I kind of left that path, I have really embrace this like try these weird pairings because sometimes you find like really bizarre things that work like ramen and zinfandel which you never like usually i think with ramen you're like oh go riesling go um you know go gavurst wiener go something that has a little bit of sweetness if you're gonna have the spice but uh it it worked so yeah. I don't know what to tell you. You got um, in the gotta comments. Try. In the comments, no. best best idea ever. Have it with, for breakfast with avocado toast. Yes. Absolutely. Breakfast wine. Breakfast Woo. wine. I love it's it. Very Italian. <laughs> so are we meeting here tomorrow at ten, you guys? <laughs> Perfect. Um, it seems you have to have mimosas in the morning. You can have red wine at breakfast. Yeah, see, break the rules. Break rules are there to be broken. I'm a full believer. If you've got your eye on a bottle and you've got an eye on a meal, what's the harm in combining the two? You know, like if you want to drink it and you want to eat it, who cares? Like, I mean, it's just, it's if you enjoy it, then who the hell is to tell you otherwise? You know, first rule of wine Absolutely. is do you like it? If you yeah. like it, drink it. Absolutely. Okay, totally agree. Cheap junk food and exquisite wine is the best. Potato chips and Riesling. Amazing. My, I, I couldn't find it, but uh, Cheez-Its did a wine 
and a cheese it box together. So they had boxed wine with cheese it. Oh, each other. I saw this. I saw this. No, it's sold out. What? It's fully. I was gonna get it for my wife because she loves cheese it. She's like, whenever she's eating cheese it, she loves wine. Oh and go on, you can go on um, eBay or whatever, you know, the second, you know, eBay, I think it is. They're going for thousands bucks now. Like, Wait, they're really what? Yeah, Wasn't yeah. it also um, they had a red and a white. like a dating app too? Wasn't it like go on a date, a virtual date and eat cheeses? I think it was before the pandemic they sold it and they discontinued oh, it. Yeah, it was oh, a couple of years ago, but yeah. Yeah, it was okay. cheap. Like a box, you got half of it was cheeses and half of it was like boxed wine. It was amazing. Oh, it was like wine alcohol and stuff. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so maybe <laughs> we should do this for our next virtual tasting. This is what bring I Bring your favorite junk food. Yes. I'm, I'm, Chipotle. I'm going to bring some Chipotle. <gasps> I love Chipotle. I just, <laughs> Chipotle um, goes great with any of our Italian ones. There's those uh, those um, salt and pepper chips, um, ripples or whatever. Yeah, yeah, the salt and pepper chips are my, my downfall. Yeah, yeah I, have, I, I can't buy the family bags anymore because I'll eat the whole thing. So I have to buy myself like little one portion ones because otherwise. I'll <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, guys, let us know what your favorite junk food and wine pair is. Um, Last night I had truffle, uh, white truffle popcorn um with the malvasia bianca and yeah popcorn like, is so good with amazing. wine although oh, yeah. sometimes i like popcorn with beer better just because oh. like popcorn and beer i don't know sometimes popcorn and beer i thought it was beer and nuts and beer yeah true well, pistachios. i'm a big pistachio fan and i'm so disappointed have you guys ever had unsalted pistachios it's the most disappointing thing you've had most disappointing thing you've had just like oh uh, oh. It's like overcooked meat. <laughs> yes. Okay, we are at the portion of the night where you have to say your favorite cut of meat. So, Jesse, yes, I want to hear. Your, well, first you, you got to go, or oh. or Tom. Okay, so um, it's fancy and it's probably not well known, but um, on the rib of a of a like I've got to say it's a rib cap. So there's a rib cap on the top of like uh, the piece of beef. You know the ribs of beef. There's a piece of layer on the top. So like the ribs are going like this. There's a rib cap on the top of it. So what they do is the, a butcher, there's a butcher in Marin. He'll take that off and then he'll roll it up and like tie it together so you can cook it like a steak. And it's the most amazing thing ever. It's, um, it's got all the flavor of a rib, like a ribeye steak and all the texture of a filet mignon. It's like the best of both worlds. And it's un- wow. So yeah, that's, that's my favorite cup. It's like I've, I haven't had it for like three years because it's not easy to get but it, it's the most amazing thing but generally i'm looking it up i'm looking it up for sure i yeah. know it sounds great. I actually so, I'll, I'll, I'll put the link in the in the thing i'll see if i can yeah. find it. Okay. okay so uh lupini i have never heard of lupini do you guys lupini. know what it it's an but, italian bean uh, Ooh, it's like oh, kind yes. of, you just gotta shoot them into your mouth they're like little snack you have, foods you have to soak them okay in that sounds great you have to soak them in lye for a week and then salt water for a week. You have to rinse oh it in. Not too different in texture from a garbanzo, garbanzo bean. beans. That's wow, so okay. Mm-hmm. Really good. It's a lot of, it sounds like a lot of work, but it sounds worth it. Well, mm-hmm. you can do them yourself or you can buy them at an Italian market that are already <laughs> done, but they're not as good if you mm-hmm. buy them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. And primitivo. That's new. I've like never heard. And then we have ribeye or Bisteca Florentina, which yes, absolutely, I love that. Great What's choice. Florentina, can I ask? I, it's just like the steak that you find in Florentina. Florence, and it's like freaking massive. At least that's what I yeah yeah. Super yeah, it's sick, like the super size massive. of your head. That sounds amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's great. It's an experience. It's for about ten. Seconds. You cook it for about ten seconds on either side. Oh, beautiful wow. olive oil and fresh sea salt and that's about it and that sounds amazing yeah yeah that's- and i'm learning so much del Monic- delmonico i honestly don't know what that is either yeah I don't, i've never heard of it is it w- was is that maybe what the meat is called that tom was talking about Whoop. no this i've got a link here um this oh, okay it and i'm really it's not, i don't pay this much but this is what i get i'm gonna put it in the chat <laughs> yeah. he's like i'm not i'm not gonna sh- my bougie me um oh, no, so i can't bougie. find it i literally can't i always have this problem i gotta go to my laptop like um 
and like <laughs> it's somewhere in there this no yeah. I, I if i could share it i would because it's well i mean i haven't i haven't bought it for three years so they might be out of business hopefully they're not oh no so before <laughs> before we started um we tom megan and i we were talking all about meats um and um tom what tom said was he's basically like my brother um <laughs> where i can't make up my mind on whether it's a um a fillet or um a ribeye and it basically comes down to um the sides if you have the right sides i'm going fillet any day but if you don't have a lot going on with your sides and it's basic then i want to i want just a big old ribeye with a little bit of fat on it that's solid advice i do i do want to bring up two things um balada somebody's got to love balada which is like just fancy prosciutto that melts before, when you touch it um that's pretty amazing and then wellingtons does anyone love a good wellington like a beef wellington or a pork wellington oh how do you i love wellington but i've only had it twice in my life because my and my sister made it and it took hours to make it's like quite you the had problem. pork wellington at my place for the harvest party the peanut okay, party so i've had it twice i've had yeah. it yours and my sister's and that's yeah, so it we're big wellington people yeah yeah and it's funny because like i don't know if i have a favorite cut of meat but you should have heard these two talking they were talking about hot dogs <laughs> wrapped in prosciutto with, cat, with, with pate on top <laughs> <laughs> sprinkle some caviar on yeah. top <laughs> and one we were cracking up and two i am not eating meat for the month of may and i was just over here dying uh being like one all of this sounds so good <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've never had a Wellington <laughs> before. Oh, we've never had Jesus, Wellington. We need to fix that. Oh well, unfortunately, I'm celiac, so um, I would have to do some research and learn how to make a gluten-free Wellington. Which, in a lot of cases, the gluten-free version of things um, isn't ever the same. But sometimes it's better. Weirdly. So so I do have to say, has anyone from been to New Zealand or Australia? Because um, basically a Wellington is just a large sausage roll, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> I miss my sausage rolls. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Okay, so America's Test Kitchen has a very good Wellington recipe. Mm -hmm. So I think you looking that, that up? looks like something, yeah, we, we need to look up. And then Jane says that she, when she was in Brazil... I ate parts of a cow I never, I never knew existed. And they were beyond delicious, but it put me in a meat coma. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was part of the neck that is really good. I ate a bull tail in Spain. Ooh, that's so interesting. One time, that bull tail. I, I have never had bull tail. Has anyone else? No. No, no it's, not, I mean, I would totally try it. The one thing that I had, which I think, is kind of a normal thing to eat but when I was like 12 this was probably the most disgusting thing that I could imagine was um, beef tongue and I I just was I ate it and I was like it tastes like a tongue like it's chewy the texture yeah. is really similar um, but I think it's kind of a normal thing to eat now like they have tongue tacos and um, I've had oh, that's not bad tacos. tongue like, tacos are good yeah, and since I've been older, I'm like, oh, delicious. I'm I'm here for it. So Tom, okay. the link the link you shared with that meat um, is actually a um, a meat ranch in Idaho. So thanks helping out my cousins. Um, but they're they're based out of American Falls, is where um actually where my family originated from. Awesome. Yeah. Really small. Baker and Bob's are like the best meat company in the country, basically. Yeah, yeah. What is it called? Snake, Snake River, River Farms. Oh, Snake River. The yeah. only like certified Wagyu makers, and yeah, yeah. so yeah. They, that, that steak is expensive. Only for very, very special occasions. Like I haven't had a special occasion for three years worthy of it. Put it that way. Um, <laughs> it's not. It's not that, though. But it's amazing. And trust me, it's worth it just once. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Paul ate horse in Puglia. That's they have butcher shops dedicated to horse. Oh my God, was it good? It, it's a delicacy in Puglia. It's and yeah. when you visit family, it's a special occasion, and you you can't say no. So it's a, it it was like uh, it was a lot like um, roast beef. So oh, it's kind interesting. Of being cooked for a long time in a tomato sauce, and, mm. and you, then 
that's about all I'll carry to say. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's so, it's interesting, like, yeah, different parts of the world, the, the different delicacies that they have. Um, I have never tried horse, but I would try it. I would yeah. try it. I did, uh, in France, I did sweetbreads, and I was like, I know what sweetbreads are. My wife was looking at me like, I know what sweetbreads are. Yeah. <laughs> I ate it. <laughs> uh, Let me finish was it, it before she told me what it is. I still forgotten what it was. It was okay. It was solid. It wasn't, like, amazing or anything. Like, it was an interesting texture. I All right, it. so who's who who like who's um gonna go with the primitivo, and who's gonna go with the grenache as being their favorite red for tonight? Because I can't make up my mind. I know that's it's a hard one. I feel like they're good for different for different things, but yeah, I think overall, just because I'm really excited that we were able to make this wine. I'm going for the Grenache. I loved it. Grenache. Hey, do you want to see my instant decanter? My instant Is that a decanter? fish? Is that a fish? Yeah, he's a puffer fish. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of these. Um, they actually work really well. Um, I have a couple of them and they all have names. <laughs> what, what's, the, what's the fish's name? Uh, it's just Bob. Bob. <laughs> Bob the puffer fish. <laughs> okay, we have both. Oh, the tail cooked in a pot roast type stew, but it was served a tail on a plate. I cannot be no, yeah, no, I, I feel that it definitely depends on how it's served. I, if it doesn't look like what it is, then, the, then I, I think the worst thing I've ever been served or like been asked to eat was um, there's a thing called a mutton bird in New Zealand, and it's like a it's like a, a cross between a seagull and a chicken. And so it's got the texture of chicken and like the flavor of fish and the greasiness, like you've never, you wouldn't believe. And it's just like, it's just all the combination. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's about the worst thing. So, yeah. The, like the taste of fish, greasy and fatty and uh, the texture of chicken. I'm from Idaho. So the worst thing I've ever had was um, whistle pig pie. Um, whistle pigs are the little, ground squirrels that stand up on their hind legs <laughs> and, oh, and oh my, God. <laughs> my neighbor when i you know um out on the farm at my big grandpa's house the neighbor he he brought up uh, these pies over and nobody was eating it and, and i started eating it and i was like oh it's not that bad this was before i was, knew i was a celiac but um i was eating it it just like tastes like a pot pie but every time i got the meat it was just really weird <laughs> really weird tasting and then everyone was laughing and they're like you're eating ground squirrel <laughs> i love it that's so interesting oh okay we like them what all primitivo is their winner. i love it awesome primitivo is the winner well yeah, what about what about you tom what's your winner for the night i think you guys summed it up pretty well i mean the white actually I, i'm going to say the white's probably my favorite right now okay. Um, the Grenache give me five years. I'll probably love that. The Primitivo, um, yeah, the Primitivo as an everyday drinker is fantastic. I could drink a lot of that. Um, the Giacomo, I would, I'd save that for special occasions with a nice piece of meat and stuff like that. And I think they're all fantastic and they're exactly designed what they're supposed to do. Um, you know, I think the Primitivo is really, really tasty right now. Yeah, right now it's the Primitivo for sure. Yeah, love it. Give the Giacondo a little bit of time. That'll soften up and become really Oh, yeah. Good. No, I think I'll be drinking that wine for years to come. <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, uh, you know, just for everyone who's on the call, we are open at Jacuzzi, so we would love to see you if you're close. And if not, um, we hope to see you soon. Yeah. yeah. Are you going to come visit sometime? sometime. Pat. Pat. Um, question for you, Pat. Um, I sent you some older Jessapina Chardonnay um, uh, the end of last year, and I was curious um, what you thought of it, because remember how I said I was going to do my homework by trying a bottle of it to make yes, sure? Yes, you were it was so perfect. thoughtful doing that. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was delicious. I shared it with everybody at the winery, all of the hosts, and we were all shocked that an older vintage Chardonnay was um, was drinking that well and still had that much acidity. It was it, amazing. It, it is pretty phenomenal. And Can you send uh, a couple of bottles back to me? 
No. <laughs> no, I might share one with you or bring my daughter up with me and we can all. Josephina is absolutely her favorite. She was heartbroken when she heard that you weren't going to be making it. Making it what anymore, was the so. vintage? Was it the 15 or the 16? 16 that you sent to me, the old one, right? And I, yeah. I do have a couple of bottles of 18. Um, she is living in Thailand right now. And so I have them all cool. stashed away in a cool, dark oh, spot nice. <laughs> until she gets home. <laughs> nice. That's so cool. Um, okay, we had a question about how long you would hold the Gioconda. Uh, I mean, like, I I think it's drinking pretty nicely now, but I think it's going to really kind of strike its, well, it's going to take, a, I'd say five years, it'll drink better. Well, every year it's going to drink better. Um, five years, you're going to start seeing the early stride of it, and I don't know, seven to eight to ten years, it's going to be where it starts peaking. Yeah. Yeah. And Jane, you have been on every, I feel like I've seen you on all of our virtual tastings. So thank you so much. So when you come in September, please let us know, please reach out. We would love to, you know, come say hi in person because I know I've seen you so much virtually. So would love to say hello in real life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So honestly, thank you guys all so much. Like I said, great way to and the week, the work week, and start off the weekend when I am going to go on my walk and drink some Arnais. And just, uh, I hope you guys all have a lovely, lovely evening. That's and awesome. Tracy and Paul, we hope to see you soon and uh, enjoy your Seattle evening. Um, thank you guys all so much for joining us and uh, hope to see you soon. It was have nice to see all of you guys. Yeah. Cheers, happy weekend. Happy weekend. Happy weekend. All right. Bye, you guys.